Hi, I'm James Naylor Green, Professor of Brazilian History and Culture at Brown University and the National Co-Coordinator of the U.S. Network for Democracy in Brazil. This program is part of the Democracy Observatory and is supported by the Washington Brazil Office. This is Brazil Unfiltered. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming a friend of many years, Valério Acari. Valério is a professor at the Federal Institute of Education, Science and Technology of Sao Paulo and one of the leading public intellectuals active in the Socialism and Liberty Party, or PSOL, as it's referred to in Brazil. Valerio is an expert on Marxist history and historiography. He has authored four books on the subject, his most recent being The Hammer of History, O Martelo da História. Valerio also regularly shares his opinions and political analysis in publications like Jacobin, Brasil de Fato, and Revista Forum. Valerio, welcome to Brazil Unfiltered. Hi, JB. It's a pleasure to be with you. And for my audience, just to know in Brazil, for some long, complicated reason, I'm known as Jimmy. Uh, and it's a very endearing uh, name that people have given to me in Brazil. So, Valeria, first of all, let's see if we can talk about the political landscape of the Brazilian left today. Could you describe it to our listeners? Well, uh, yes. Um, if we consider in an historical perspective, uh, we can say that uh, until the military coup in 64, the most influent uh, party in Brazilian left was the Communist Party. But uh, that changed completely uh, after those 20 years of the military dictatorship. Because in the late 70s, uh, in early 80s, we had a very singular experience that was the foundation of the Workers' Party. The Workers' Party, it was uh, original, a very original in Latin America experience of uh, building a, a political party that could express the independency of the interests of the working people. It, it was joined by different components, different fractions. Uh, first of all, of course, the union leaders, uh, metal workers, teachers, workers, bank, banking workers, uh, petrol workers, civil construction workers, union leaders, that were expressing a new generation of the working class. At the same time, it was joined by the left wing of the Catholic Church that was inspired in progressive ideas that had a, a very strong influence in popular movements, territorial uh, social movements. It was joined by the survivors of the Brazilian left that had uh, joined the military, the armed resistance to the dictatorship, although most of the most important activists, militants and leaders that were, um, were assassinated and uh, it, it and in, in also an important uh, sector of the what we could call an, a new generation of left intellectuals. So the Workers Party has been for the last forty years or for four decades the most important uh, left organization, and um, it, it maintains its it influence. But there are uh, also uh, smaller organizations. There we have the, the three small communist parties uh, with uh, differences between them. Uh, some of them have uh, a Maoist, uh, opposed Maoist influence. Others are. Uh, it's the Communist Party that was historically linked with Moscow. And um, we have a third party, a third one, the smallest, essentially with some influence in the, the Northeast 
of the country. So we have the PC du B, U PCB, U PCR, smallest. And we have also uh, in with legal uh, representation as a small but national uh, in, with a certain national implementation, Trotskyist organizations, the PSTU. And we have the PSOL, which I belong. So the PSOL, it's a decision, it's a, a sector that um, decided to organize in an independent way. Uh, in 2004, in the second year of the first Lula government, and it's um, it's a party that we could call um, a socialist, independent, left-wing party with different uh, strategical uh, definitions at, in its interior. It means that it's a plural party with different tendencies and currents. With a uh, with presence in the National Congress, we have at this in this moment eight national uh, members of Congress. Uh, we are the second most uh, influent party in Brazil. It means we have an audience in the working class, in the unions, in metal workers, in different sectors of the working class. We have an important influence in the feminist and in the black in, in movements, in the youth, in the indigenous uh, resistance, in the cultural um, movement, and, uh, and, and also in the ecological and ambiental left movements, and a, a general anti-capitalist inspiration. So you would say that unlike the United States, if where we think that the kind of organized left coming from the Marxist tradition is quite small and has very little visibility in Congress, PSOL does have some national impact and influence. Is that correct? Is I think it's correct, although minority, when we consider the influence of the Workers' Party, the PSOL has a national uh, identity, has a certain what we'd call um, a moral integrity, and uh, an intellectual consistency that gives some authority to what the soul says. says. That means that what we could call the, 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 the left, uh, people that look at the left with, uh, with hope, uh, generally can vote for a majority uh, dispute in the workers' part candidate the candidacy, but would also give votes to Psol uh, when it presents the, the uh, when we present our our, our cadres to uh, election of members of Congress or local um, parliament. So, so in this coming election, you are supporting Lula. And yeah. so what, what, what are your thoughts about his alliance with the former Sao Paulo governor, Geraldo Alckmin, who was also uh, the political adversary, uh, adversary of both Lula and Dilma in two presidential races? What do you think about this strategy by Lula to have invited a former member of the Party of Brazilian Social Democracy to join him um, in, in the electoral coalition as his vice presidential candidate? Well, we were against it, uh, you know, Jimmy. We were against it because um, although the, the 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 party that calls himself Social Democracy Brazilian Party, it's not really a social democracy uh, party. Uh, you, it, it was uh, founded. Uh, it was organized in the eighties. In the in the eighties, all the political situation in Brazil was. Uh, turning to the left, it was the, the moment of the final um, measure of forces with the dictatorship. So the political vocabulary in the 80s had turned all to the left. It's actually uh, the PSDB, the Social Democracy, is actually a liberal party. Uh, it means it's a capitalist party, although it's... Um, 
it's uh, it's very influent in Sao Paulo and has a, a strong support of what we could call the most concentrated fraction of the Brazilian uh, bourgeoisie. And um, we think uh, that it's a mistake uh, to invite uh, Alchemy for several reasons, but the most important is that it's impossible to understand the Brazilian situation if, without a, a certain um, uh, context, historical context. Uh, it, it, and the most important thing that happened in Brazil uh, since uh, in the last five years is that uh, in 2016, we had uh, a political institutional uh, parliamentary coup. That means that um, for the different factors, uh, at first, uh, a, minor, a minority section of the Brazil, Brazilian capitalists, and then they unified themselves, decided that they had to uh, in, make a, organize a, a, a mass movement and a, a Congress initiative to impeach Dilma Rousseff that had been re-elected in 2014. And um, the PSDB and Alkman, they, they were at the head of this movement. They organized mass mobilizations in the street with millions of people, millions, five, six millions of people, the most, mo most massive mobilizations since uh, 84, when we had the, 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 the campaign to... Um, to defeat the dictatorship and to um, try to uh, co conquer the national free uh, direct elections to, to the pr presidency of Brazil. And Alckmin was a very important, uh, at the time, leader of the PSB. He supported this movement. So uh, for different reasons, uh, Alckmin, uh, is now kind of a freelancer, Jimmy. It means that he lost the last election. He, he tried to, to win 2018 national election against Bolsonaro and against Fernando da Haddad. That was the candidate that the uh, Workers' Party presented. We had presented also Bolos, Guilherme Bolos, that, that uh, two years after, tried to elect himself as mayor in Sao Paulo and went to a second turn and uh, a second round, a second round. But Alpine in 2018 had, it was a, a completely defeated. So he became um, a very secondary personality inside his own party. So he became a freelancer and it was kind of a, a, a political surprise, a, a very surprising maneuver uh, that the, the leadership of the Workers' Party and Lula himself uh, invited him to be vice president. We think that's a mistake. It, 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 I understand the, the strategy, the, the meaning of the strategy is to uh, signalize to the dominant class, to the ca ca Brazilian capitalist, that Lula, although he was arrested and stayed in prison for over the 500 days, if he wins the election, he is not, um, how could we say, he is not dominado uh, pelo rancor, Jimmy. He's not... He's not uh, motivated by his anger or his resentment. His resentment, perfect, exactly. It, it means that... Uh, alchemy it's a symbol of a um, an, uh, political uh, commitment to um, restrain, to accept negotiations. It, 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 it means that although the Workers' Party is a left party, it would not be a left government. It would be a coalition government uh, with the main co commitment to respect the regime institutions and legal limits. And uh, we were critical, but we consider 
that it was not an, uh, an obstacle to, to make the, the alliance and support Lula. So, what, so then explain what would have been the argument to say we need to uh, criticize this decision of his but still support Lula's candidacy for the presidency. Why, why is the PSOL uh, decided to support Lula in spite of this decision to invite Alckmin as his exactly. vice presidential candidate? We decided, although Alckmin, despite Alckmin, because um, it's very, uh, the, the, the central issue in Brazil is to defeat Bolsonaro. So um, it, it, it's, and it's very important to understand what is Bolsonaro, what kind of government we had for the last, last three uh, and a half years. Well, it's a right-wing government and it's coalition, different sectors of the right wing. But Bolsonaro and Bolsonarismo, Bolsonarism is a neo-fascist current. Inside the government, you have uh, right-wing people that are not neo-fascist. You have ultra-liberals like Geddes, who is the economy minister. You have the central, uh, what it's, I don't think we can find the, the perfect translation for, for, for English, but it may, it, it's called a, a big center, but that would be a, a, a rustic translation, but it's really a right wing majority of members of, in, of Congress that had, have been supporting all the governments in Brazil for the last 35 years. And we have the military faction also, that they are right-wing, but they are not all of them fascist. But Bolsonarism is neo-fascist. And defeating Bolsonaro is absolutely uh, strategic. If we have uh, a, com a commitment to defend uh, democratic liberties, democratic freedoms. Uh, Bolsonaro is really um, a threat to uh, civilized, uh, uh, civilized uh, life, social life. And um, he has a strategy. His strategy is to impose an authorita authoritarian regime. He's in conflict with, with the regime. It, in this moment, uh, he's leading a campaign against the elections. He is making every day, uh, denouncing every day, all the organized process, process of the election. So he can say the day after the elections, when he lose and he will lose these elections, that the, he was, uh, it was a fraud. It was... Um, he was victim of electoral fraud and to organize his social basis and he has demonstrated that he has the capacity to uh, mobilize uh, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets. He made that last year, the 7th 7, 7 September, which is the day of national independence in Brazil. Last 1st May, he also uh, organized mass mobilizations in the street, although not so big as last year's 7th of September. So he's, uh, organized, he's organizing a campaign to dispute the result of the elections and not accept his electoral defeat. So the main reason why we support Lula is that it's because Lula is the electoral instrument to defeat Bolsonaro. And nothing is more important than defeating Bolsonaro. And uh, we couldn't do it through the, the popular resistance during the last three and a half years. So we'll have to face him in the, in the ballot in, in the elections. And so uh, assuming uh, Lula wins the election and the polls are all indicating that he is likely to uh, be the front runner in the first round, if not winning all out in the first round, and if there's a runoff, he is very likely to win. 
what will be the role of PSOL and the left with the new government, with the new Lula government? How, how will you position yourselves after Lula is, is elected, if he is elected? Well, PSOL, it's a very serious organization. So we had the National Con Electoral Conference last month, uh, a month ago, and uh, we decided we would support Lula. We presented uh, 12 uh, programmatic, programmatic uh, proposals uh, as a minimum program to support, to give our political support. But we also approved a, a resolution that we would not negotiate our particip participation in the, a future Lula government. That means it's not a condition for sole support to have uh, positions inside the Lula government. We don't ask nothing in return for our political support. We give our support because we are have a ide ideological, uh, programmatic, and political political uh, commitment to defeat Bolsonaro and uh, open a way for Lula to express the will of the majority of our working class and uh, all, the, all the oppressed, the women, the black people, the youth, the, the indigenous people, all the, all the social and popular movements in Brazil. And uh, what will be the Lula government? Well, that, that, that is a, a team of serious speculation. Nobody knows. And um, I, I don't think even that the Workers' Party leadership has decided exactly what kind of government or Lula himself will be. That depends of on, on a lot of factors, uh, depend of the election results, depend of the um, different positions that all the s political super structure will have. So uh, it's something to debate um, after the election, but most probably, considering Alkamin and considering what is being um, discussed, uh, uh, this, the, the PSOL will be at the side of Lula against the right wing reaction that probably will be uh, infuriated. But the PSOL will not give caters to the Lula government and will preserve an independent position in the National Congress and will uh, prioritize its um, political activities inside the social movements, the women's movements, the black movements, the unions, the working class movements. We think we are more useful if we prioritize rank and file, uh, implanted uh, political initiative in the in the in what we could call in Portuguese we, Portuguese we would say trabalho de base. So uh, there would I, be rank and file work or work among uh, the rank and file or grassroots organizing. Exactly. Yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about the other forces within uh, Lula's broad coalition of political parties that have agreed to support his campaign besides PSOL. We have the Brazilian Socialist Party. And in fact, uh, vice presidential candidate Alckmin has left. He left the PSDB, the, Brazilian, the party of Brazilian Social Democracy, to join the Brazilian Socialist Party. And it has become an important political force in Brazil, I think. Um, including the fact that several well-known uh, political figures from the right and the left have joined the party. For example, Alckmin uh, joined from the, P, uh, the party of the Brazilian Social Democracy, but also Congresswoman uh, Tabacha Amaral, who was in the Brazilian, uh, the Democratic Labor Party, joined the PSB. Um, on the left, Flavio Dino, who had been in the Communist Party of Brazil and was the governor of the state of Marinhão in the north, and is currently a candidate for Senate, for example, also joined uh, the PSB, as, as did uh, the former, uh, co the congressman and current gubernatorial candidate of Rio de Janeiro, Marcelo Freixo. Freixo. So, so how would you explain to an uninformed audience what the PSB is and what political role do you think it'll be playing in the foreseeable future? 
Well, um, we have um, in Brazil, we have a, a peculiarity that is that we have 35 legal parties and 25 of them have presence within the National Congress, have members of Congress. So we don't have 35 different visions of Brazil. We don't have 35 different programs. So it's uh, for an, uh, a North American uh, audience, it would be uh, a peculiarity. It's maybe um, uh, not a strong word to define this chaotic uh, party system. And it, this, that happens for several factors, but in the, the result is that we have electoral parties that are not really um, a political party in the sense that they don't have a program, they don't have a strategy, they don't have a vision of the country, they don't, they don't have an ideology. They are, are electoral parties. And um, the PSB is controlled by a family. And in, in Pernambuco, it's um, the, a very important state in the northeast of Brazil, but peripheral. Because to understand Brazil, you have, it, since it's, it's a continental country, it's important to, um, to understand that we have uh, this uh, strategical triangle it would be São Paulo, Minas Gerais, and Rio de Janeiro. This is the strategical triangle. Nobody can uh, lead Brazil if you don't have political support in this triangle, where the, that means uh, it, this is where the, 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 the majority of the nation and the majority of the economical, social, cultural life um, develops. So Pernambuco, it's a very important state in Northeast, but it's peripheral. And the PSB is controlled by a family, the, the, the Arraiz family. Um, they have now the governor, Paulo Câmara, and they have the mayor of Recife, João Campos. And they um, play a role in this alliance, although it's quite artificial. You can imagine how ridiculous it was when they made the, their Congress like four or five years, weeks ago. And Alcumin had to sing the international, the famous um, song that it's uh, one of the traditional um, tokens of the left all over the world. You can imagine Alcumin, who was a leader of the most rich, concentrated power fraction of the Brazilian bourgeoisie, joining a party that calls himself Socialist Party and plays the song. But in not many years ago, they had they were running for mayor in São Paulo with Paulo Scaff, Jimmy. Paulo Scaff was the former president of the most important um, civil. Uh, organization of the Brazilian industrial capitalist, the Fiesp. So he was running for mayor through the social Brazilian party. So either SCAF is not a social, either the party is not a socialist, or both of them are not socialist. It's an electoral party. Um, and uh, would could, would, it wouldn't be unfair to say that uh, liberal, semi-social democratic uh, center-left uh, party organizing through electoral interests of clans, local clans and local families. So, so why then would someone from the Communist Party of Brazil which was a traditionally a pro-Maoist, pro-Chinese party many years ago during the dictatorship, or someone who was in the PSOL, very, very well known, who is now the candidate for governor, um, Marcelo Freixo. Why would they? Why would they go to the PSD? Is it merely just because they need a party on which to run? They need a. They, they need, need a, a party, party to run, and they were in, uncomfortable. Well, Dino was uncomfortable because he cannot. Uh, um, ambition uh, 
ha he cannot has, have the ambition of a national political career, career after being government of Maranhão uh, through the Communist Party. It's not possible. And uh, Freixo also because he was uncomfortable in so because he wanted to run for governor in Rio, but make an alliance that uh, some kind of alliances that the PSOL would never support. He made uh, several very, in our opinion, dangerous movements that he could not make if he was still in the in the, the PSOL, and he also could not make that that kind of movement if he went to the workers party that could be an alternative so he went to the to the the psb because it's comfortable because nobody controls so when a figure like uh, uh, marcelo freixo freixo joins the psb he is the psb in rio so uh, at at one point he was at the psol at the other he is at psb now he controls the psb so it's um, it's an electoral movement. It means that they can change of party in the next few years. Uh, the, yeah, there have been some candidates, including Ciro Gomes, who was a candidate from the Democratic uh, Labour Party, who who, who uh, has been, I think, in nine different or eight or nine different political parties over the course of his life. Exactly. Uh, as people say, changing political parties like you change your underwear. Exactly. You can't, it's not reasonable in a 40 years career to change seven, eight times of party, but that's, it's not, it's not unusual in Brazil. And uh, so it's complicated. <laughs> As I told you, the, the, the party system is complicated. And since the majority of our people don't vote for parties, it, you, you have to understand this uh, peculiarity of Brazil. Uh, it, it's not like in Argentina. In Argentina, when you, 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 you grow up in a family, everybody in, the, his, in a family is normal to have a, 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 a political preference and also a football preference. So if you were born in a Boca Juniors or in a River Plate family and your family was Peronist, you would probably be a Peronist, some kind of Peronist, some kind of uh, radical. In Uruguay also, not in Brazil. In Brazil, like eighty percent of the, 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 the of our population don't have a political preference. Ideological uh, identities are not strong in Brazil. So elections are uh, organized through um, leaders, persons. People vote in persons. Maybe not only for local elections would be reasonable because you have a chance to know who you are voting but also in uh, general elections so people have uh, identity uh, sympathy no you don't say sympathy for in that sense uh, some kind of identity or preference for uh, one leader or or, or, or or another leader so this is key also key to understand the role of Lula because Lula is much bigger than the workers party uh, much bigger. Although I think you could say fairly that there is a very strong identification with a large segment of the population with the Workers' Party over the years, although people who were very loyal or very active in it, many have left for various reasons. But there's still more, I think, party identification with the Workers' Party than probably any other political party. Oh, exactly. We have pools on that. The Workers' Party historically had a preference of uh, between 25 and 30%. When the, the other parties have precedents like one percent, two percent, the the biggest uh, bourgeois parties have one, two, three percent. During the crisis, during this five years of reactionary situation, the workers' part preference uh, came down to seventeen, but now it's all uh, uh, it's uh, again. Uh, getting bigger it, at the last pool it was uh, all, uh, around 27 percent i thought i think so we also so we have uh, this um, characteristic it means the the sector the the, the, the of the population that supports the psol uh, has um, is proportionally it's much bigger than national representation in Congress. So, so uh, Brazilian National Congress has 513 national members. 
we have eight. But parties that have 1% or we have like 2 3%, depends on the pools. And in big cities, we have like four, five, maybe even a little bit more when we speak about Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo, like 7 8%. But it, it doesn't mean that we'll have a, national, a presence in the National Congress uh, proportional to these uh, four or five percent. Even the Workers' Party down, the Workers' Party has one of the biggest uh, representation National Congress, like uh, uh, 53 over 513. That means um, like... Ten uh, percent. Ten percent, yes. So you've been talking about the, Congre the Congress. Let's just jump right in there. So many people are focused on the presidential election, but I can't help but think that not enough attention is being directed towards the Congress. So what are your thoughts? Do you think it's possible that the left will surprise people and increase their representation in Congress awesome. in the elections? And, and so just for the audience, uh, it's uh, all of the, 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 the lower house, which is called the Chamber of Deputies, will uh, be reelected or it will be up for election. And then a th approximately a third of the Senate. Senate. Exactly. Oh, yes, I do think the, the, the left will have probably the best uh, election in many, many, many years. We'll, we'll get bigger. I think uh, it's, uh, in, 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 we don't have a method to, uh, to calculate how bigger we will be, but we'll get bigger. It's uh, since the beginning of this um, political process, we are getting more in our influence in society has getting bigger because the the relation of forces uh, when we think of in, in class uh, relation of forces in brazil it changed we went through five years of rec very reactionary situation it meant that the working class lost confidence in, her, in, in, in herself. The middle classes swinged to uh, the right and a, a part of the middle classes swing to the radical extreme right wing with sympathy, with very a, a big influence of neo-fascist ideas. And uh, the dominant class for, uh, for five years maintained its unity uh, with a, a, a strategy of rip, a new position of Brazil in the international market since the relations between between USA and China changed the the Brazilian bourgeoisie was unified in a project to attract international in general but especially, American, North American investments in Brazil. It, it, it you know, since China be, became the most uh, important address to U.S. investments um, for for thirty years, or maybe thirty five years, between forty the, the end of the Second World War and uh, the nineties. Brazil was the major direction of U.S. international investments in the world. It was Brazil. Then came China. And in the, the middle of the last decade, uh, it was clear that the conflict in, in, in international state systems had became uh, they, they became bigger between Washington and Beijing and the, the, the Brazilian bourgeoisie in general, especially Sao Paulo fraction of the Brazilian bourgeoisie that is the most powerful one, they aim to attract international investments and that's one of the most important reasons to support the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff and to open a way to what we could call a restructuration re of the Brazilian peripheral capitalism and try to level the costs of capital to would be the standard uh, level that now 
uh, international capitalists can find in Asia in general, in China in special. They try to make a certain level, but that this, this is not possible without a, what we could call a historical defeat of the working class. A historical defeat is something that is very, very serious. In Brazil, we had that in 64, and we had this military regime for 20 years. It means that one generation, Jimmy, is uh, demoralized. And, and a historical defeat, it means that all the, the, the social movements, they, uh, they are disorganized. They are... Um, um, they, they lose their capacity of activism and resistance. So this was a project. It was the project to, uh, to make Brazil, again, the main address to international in investment. And this project uh, finally uh, found a rep representation in this sad and dangerous uh, figure that's Bolsonaro. So if we, um, we think about the, uh, the situation uh, in the Congress, uh, PSOL has uh, established a fairly strong base of support, especially in Sao Paulo. And in my opinion, it's running some very electable candidates who, um, uh, who have not held a federal office for exactly. uh, the lower house, the chamber of deputies, such as Guilherme Bolos, as you mentioned, who was a candidate for uh, the, the mayor of, of Sao Paulo, who led the homeless people's movement in Sao Paulo. Sonia Guajajara, who is a very important indigenous activist and leader. Erika Hilton, who is a trans LGBTQIA plus activist. Uh, Pastor Enrique, who is a progressive evangelical Christian. And even Bella Gil, who is the daughter of one of Brazil's most important uh, song writers and singers, uh, Gilberto Gil, but in her, of herself is a culinary specialist and a TV, TV personality and really gives great advice on how to cook wonderful food. And I think most of these are running in for federal office in Sao Paulo. So what is PSOL's electoral strategy regarding the Congress? Well, we must, to maintain our legality, to elect at least 11 members of Congress. We think we can go over that. We can, we, you, you, all of those that you, uh, uh, you mentioned are really very strong candidates. We also have Ivan Valente in Sao Paulo, who is a, a leader of the, the oldest generation of um, Marxist activists in the Brazilian left. We have uh, Samia Bonfim, who is a young feminist already elected in 2018 to, to be a, a Sao Paulo member of the Congress. We have Erundina that was um, 30 years ago, uh, mayor in Sao Paulo, also uh, a leader of the oldest generation of the, the Brazilian left, one of the leaders at the, uh, the foundation of the Workers' Party. And um, we have uh, in, in, in Rio very important candidates like Tarcísio, who is um, a leader of the of teachers' movements, educational movements. We have Talidia Petroni, which is uh, a young, brilliant black movement uh, member of Congress, one of the heirs of Marielle Franco um, legacy, and so on. We think we can go uh, stronger in. At, in the south, in Rio Grande do Sul, in elect, we don't have a member of Congress in Rio Grande do Sul at this moment. We think we can elect one. We have uh, great hopes. Uh, we have great hopes in Minas Gerais. We have uh, an important black, yeah, very young, under 30 years old, uh, black movement leadership. It's called An Isa Lorenzo. She is now. She was elected two years ago to Belo Horizonte um, part, uh, city part, uh, city council, city council, and uh, she she's disputing 
she, she could be elected. And we have also hopes in Bahia, in, in, in Pernambuco. So we hope that we will go over 11 members of the Congress. Uh, we don't have, of course, um, it's impossible to make polls to, uh, since the, the electoral conditions in Brazil, we, we can't, it, we, we cannot afford to make polls to know exactly what to expect, but probably in Sao Paulo we'll elect six, maybe seven members of parliament. I, I do hope we can elect four in Rio, one or two in, in Minas, one in Rio Grande do Sul. So maybe between 11 and 15, 16, it's not, um, it's not a, a delusion. It's, and so when uh, the, the Brazilian elects... The Brazilian electoral law requires um, a, at least 11 members of Congress in order to continue to receive federally supported um, uh, electoral financing. Is that correct? Are there any other limitations if you don't reach the 11, uh, 11 pe person mark in yes. terms of uh, what your rights are as a party? What are the other restrictions if you don't reach we the have 11? To, uh, we have to conquer 2% of the all the voters for the National Congress in at least nine states, 2% in nine states and 11 members in Congress. The 2%, it's, it's easier for us. The difficulty to go... Oh, oh, well, and if you, if you don't make the, um, the, these, these goals, these, these uh, benchmarks, then you lose federal funding for the campaign? Do you lose any other rights uh, if you don't reach this benchmark? Because Actually, you if we lose that, it's a sem we, we are restricted to a semi-legal organization. It means we are not prohibited to be a political party, but we don't have any kind of rights. So during the elections, we will be in invisibles. We will never have access to uh, radio and television broadcasting, and that means, although it's important to have uh, active presence in 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 the social media and in it, in the in the internet, uh, if you don't have the funding in uh, continental and well, it's very difficult because our our when when we choose someone to run for Congress, we choose those that have given proofs in the social fights. These people don't have money. Their families don't have money. And to make a campaign, you really need money. For instance, you, you need money to travel, which is not, it's not cheap in Brazil to travel. It's it, it, in, in, in the majority of the states, you, you cannot travel by, with cars. You can make a 200, 300, maybe a 400 uh, trip in a car, but you can't, it is not reasonable to make 1,000 kilometers <laughs> run in a car. It's not reasonable. You can't make a, a political campaign like that. So, in, in fact, when you lose, uh, when you don't achieve the 2% in the 11 members of Congress, you are condemned to be invisible. So, to finalize our conversation today, Valeria... And you are broke. You are completely broke. <laughs> yeah, right. To, uh, to finalize our conversation today, I wanted to go back to a point we talked about earlier in our conversation, which uh, is really the main uh, campaign of the Washington Brazil office in this moment, which is precisely to defend democracy in Brazil in any way possible. And one of the concerns that we have uh, is the possibility, as you implied, that Bolsonaro might mobilize his forces following Donald Trump's uh, playbook declaring the elections fraudulent, declaring that he actually won, that they, the election results were manipulated, mobilize his forces and perhaps bring the, um, the, con yes. the, the, the armed forces into the, into the battle. Certainly, the, and per per perhaps also the military police, which are controlled by different state organizations. So um, last year, the CIA representative was in Brazil and had a meeting with Bolsonaro and indicated that the U.S. government, that is the Biden administration, believed in Brazilian democracy and was against any questioning of the electoral process. And that was reinforced by a statement of the Undersecretary, for, uh, of, of, Undersecretary of State recently and also in a statement by 
uh, the spokesperson of the State Department, and more recently by Elizabeth Bagley, who is the uh, future ambassador from the United States to Brazil, all saying the same thing, which is that Brazilian democracy is strong, that it's 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 facing some challenges, but the United States believes in democracy and wants to support and hope there will be free and fair elections and that the results of the elections will be recognized. Um, what do you think are the real possibilities that Bolsonaro might, in fact, uh, try to carry out some kind of mobilizations for a coup? The Workers' Party now is trying to under kind of diminish that possibility, um, perhaps not to incentivate the idea, to encourage the idea. Um, what is your assessment? I think it's clear and real danger, Jimmy. Clear and real danger. That means they, they are organizing a campaign and it's not a bluff. So their strategy is to bring chaos, a, a social convulsion. It's not a military coup. We're not in the, the last historical uh, period. Uh, we are in a new situation for the last 30 years. The, the USSR don't exist anymore. But all his campaign against communism, against uh, uh, criticizing the electoral uh, system, um, and he is actually every day saying that a fraud is being organized. He's saying it before the election. So it's clear that the most probably uh, he will try to organize chaos and the social conversion. How he can do that? Mobilizing the 200,000 people that went to Paulista Avenue in 7 September in the street, uh, infuriated, um, crying against uh, his defeat. Of course, he's not planning a military coup. To do that, he has to at least ten factors would be would be would have to be present. He would have to ha have behind him the support of the most powerful faction of the capitalist uh, bourgeoisie. He doesn't. He has the, the support, Jimmy, of the mass of the bourgeoisie. When we think the mass of the bourgeoisie, we're talking about three million people, different kind of capitalists. He, he has the support of this majority. All the pool says uh, that a businessman, essentially, supporting over 60%, when Lula has 20%. So he has the support of the mass of the Budoji, but he doesn't have the support of the leaders of the capital, Brazilian captains. You cannot, you cannot make a coup without them. You cannot make a coup without the complicity of the U.S. government. You just said that U.S. government is um, for different with different uh, uh, messages, arguing that they, they will not support any kind of electoral uh, maneuver. You have to have the support of the majority of the middle class to a confront. He doesn't. The middle class had supported him four years ago in big majority, now they are a uh, fraction. He has support, but he's not, he doesn't have the, 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 the majority. You, you need to have the support of, and the united support of the high officials in the armed forces. He doesn't. He has a fraction. His fraction is important, but the, the armed forces are not unified with the idea of an, uh, 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 some kind of convulsion coup, you, you, he would have to have the support of the, the 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 most important broadcast and TVs and radio, which he doesn't. He would also have to have the support of uh, the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is very important in Brazil. It was key for the 64 coup. He doesn't. And we could go on. So um, a military coup in the sense of what happened in Bolivia three years ago, it's not possible because he would lose. And, and, and he, he would not lose because we would be 
submerge in a civil war. He would lose because it's not possible to make it. And he knows that. But that doesn't mean that he cannot make a coup maneuver. The coup maneuver has one main strategical objective. He is afraid not of losing the election. He's afraid what comes next. The, he's afraid that his political tendency, this now fascist movement, would be illegalized and he would be um, criminally um, denouncing and maybe go to prison. He and some of the key leaders of his current. So his objective is to make the, cap the Capitolio maneuver, the Trump maneuver, in a bigger scale because he would not try to invade the National Congress, some Vikings. <laughs> That's not what he will do. But he can organize a social convention, calling to the street their, their his uh, most radical supporters. And that would be to signalize that I, Bolsonaro is untouchable. That's the main strategical question. He wants to maintain his um, legal political presence and he and his clan and the leaders with, that are associated, associated with him would be untouchable. I think that's the main objective. That's the main danger. It's clear. The leadership of the Workers' Party, Jimmy, they have been denouncing that. But Lula doesn't. So it's, uh, it's really a, a little bit uh, paradoxical because uh, the members of the superior courts in Brazil, they denounce the campaign. The, the, the director of the CIA denounces the campaign. The U.S. new ambassador denounces the campaign. The most important broadcasting, uh, radio and TV, is they denounce the campaign. The workers' leaders' movement and the PSOL leaders and the union leaders and feminist black movements, all the social movements, we denounce the campaign. Lula keeps silent. But is that this, a tactical silence just to avoid polarization? It's a tactical uh, silence. And um, it's, uh, I think, is a wrong cal calcul, but it's a tactical silence. So the final question I have around this question is like, what do you think uh, civil society, political organizations should be doing uh, in Brazil, not only now denouncing the possibility, but if in fact he starts mobilizing people? on October 3rd or October 31st. That would be a dramatic situation which we wouldn't have any other way than um, appealing, calling our social basis to go also to the streets. We would have to accept that we will have to, uh, when he makes his rallies when 100 to 100,000 people in Sao Paulo, Brazil, or Rio, we would have to uh, be able to gather 500,000, 1 million people. There is no other way. We have to be able to have a mass mobilization of all the uh, most uh, powerful social movements in Brazil. That means the, the union movement, the feminist movement, black people movement. And we, I think we can do it. I think we have a sport. And in the, if this dramatical challenge is uh, in perspective, we should prepare ourselves to win this challenge. So how do you then respond or how do you then deal with the, the possibility? And this is all kind of speculation that in this process, infiltrators, agents provocateurs might uh, cause conflicts between the two forces, the pro-democracy forces and the proto-pro-fascist uh, forces. Uh, physical conflict, physical fighting that could break out, and then uh, the excuse to call in uh, the military police uh, to repress the demonstrations and maybe the armed forces to establish order, which is one of the roles that the armed forces has proclaimed for itself and is, remains in the 1988 Constitution. In other words, is this a movement which will be led by a clear nonviolent uh, attitude yes. of no provocations or how will how will 
leadership responsibly defend democracy in Brazil without being uh, set up for uh, a pretext for the possibility of, of the armed forces coming in to allegedly restore order. Exactly. That's the, the challenge. We have to mobilize to defend dem democracy, and we have to mobilize with uh, the will to win, but all with the, also with the responsibility, uh, the maturity that uh, we, we will be provoked. And we cannot respond to provocation. We have to act with uh, major responsibility. Uh, and I think we can win. I think we have uh, organizations that are strong enough to demonstrate with uh, responsibility, but also with, uh, with the win to, will to win. Valerio, thank you so much for this wonderful interview on Brazil Unfiltered. I, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, well, it was my pleasure, Jimmy. We've been, we know each other for 40 years, four decades. So, but Jimmy looks exactly how he looked when he was a young student in the um, Sao Paulo um, University. Many, many, many years ago, indeed. Four decades. Well, it was a pleasure to be with you. And um, I hope that all our expectations will be um, achieved. And thank you so much for your beautiful British uh, English accent. It's charming, I must say. <laughs> so uh, I hope that you've enjoyed the interview. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like the video. And if you have not yet subscribed, please do so. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast, please leave us a five-star review. It helps other people find the program. Have a great week. Until next time, até a próxima.